hi everybody and welcome to our very first edition of Astronomy Off Tap. The bars and pubs might be closed across the UK at the minute, but that does not mean that the science is stopping, not at all. So tonight we have three really great speakers lined up for you to carry on sharing um, our passion for space and astronomy back at home safely from the comfort of your living room. So we have Shin Ran coming up first, who's going to talk about um, dark matter and the Bulby Underground Laboratory followed by Manisha, who will talk about fast radio bursts. And then finally, Moya, who's all the way in the US at the minute, who will be talking about the galactic bulge. So great, exciting things coming up. Um, and obviously being AOT Edinburgh, we have our bit of a daft game halfway through with John, our epic quiz master. So hopefully you can play along at home with that. So for those of you who are not familiar with Astronomy on Tap, we are basically a global constellation of space geeks who meet up in a pub or a bar once a month to talk about the latest things happening in science, astronomy and space science. Um, it's aimed at the general public who assume to have no majorly high levels of knowledge about any of this. It's to make it easy, understandable and for us to share our passion with the members of the public such as yourselves um, and obviously being in slightly strange circumstances we are today we wanted to carry that on so we invite you to grab a drink sit back and drink in the universe with us so first up we're going to pass over to Jin Ran who's going to talk about dark matter over to Jin Ran thanks Amy uh, okay let me share my screen with everybody hi everybody good evening I'm here to give you a tour of the Bowlby underground laboratory so before I start, this picture was taken last year and actually won a British photography award. So it's showing that, you know, we're not only a science facility, but also an excellent photo studio. So I just thought I'd share that with everybody. So before I talk about the underground lab, I thought I'd talk a little bit about the mine. So Bowlby is a working potash polyhalite and rock salt mine uh, set in the northeast coast of England. So it's a major local employer and employs some 7,000 people direct, 700 people directly and 3,000 people indirectly. So it's a huge operation. It runs 360 plus days of the year, and they mine over 40 kilometers a tunnel each year. I didn't even know we had active uh, mining in the UK until I went to Bowlby in 2013. So that was a very exciting place to work and see. Um, but how does this, any of this relate to astronomy? Uh, well, in the 1900s, people like Lord Kelvin of Glasgow and Franz Zwicky and Caltech were proposing the existence of something called dark matter. But it wasn't until the 70s when Vera Rubin did her famous measurements of galaxy rotation curves uh, when she was looking at uh, the way these uh, stars around galaxies moved. And she was expecting as the stars moved further away from the galactic center, they would move slower. But instead, she said she saw that they moved just as fast. And this linked to the idea that there must be something uh, holding the galaxies together and making them rotate at the speed and we cannot see it. So hence why it's called dark matter. Um, and since then, there's been many more evidence to support the existence of dark matter, but they've all been uh, coming from astronomical uh, observations, but they've all been considered kind of indirect measurements of dark matter. What we want to do is detect dark matter directly in a laboratory setting. And there's three ways to go about doing that. And you can make it, break it, or shake it. So you can make it by in a collider like the LHC at CERN. You can break it by looking for dark matter annihilations coming from space using the AMS experiment uh, in, in, currently in the International Space Station, or you can shake it, which is you make a large target mass and you let dark matter smash into your detector and you look for it that way. And this third method has been really one of the most successful methods of dark matter searches up to date. And here, you know, you don't want to build your detector on the surface of the earth because you're gonna get bombarded by lots of cosmic radiations coming from all over space. And that's gonna swamp out any signal chances of finding dark matter signals. So what you want to do is build it deep underground. And that's where Bowlby comes in handy because the lab is already set 1.1 kilometers underground in the Bowlby salt mines in incredibly stable salt tunnels. Uh, and that can shield uh, the rate of cosmic radiations by a factor of millions. So that's why scientists have been going to Bowlby uh, in the, since the early 90s to be building dark matter experiments there. And th the Bowlby underground facility is fully funded by the UK Science Technology Funding Council. And as you can see here, um, with increasing and it's hosted many dark matter detectors over the years from the NIAID experiment to drip to Zeppelin one, two, and three, uh, and now uh, Cygnus. So with each increasing uh, 
generation of new dark matter detectors, the sizes have really increased as well. So the first ever dark matter detector, you might be able to see here in the bottom right, was literally inside a garden shed built into the stub in the tunnel. But you know, as our ambitions grew, so did the size of the labs. And you know, you can see here various new labs were constructed, which each time getting bigger, and the latest being this one constructed in 2017, which is what I'm going to show you today. But you know, with this new lab, we did lose one awesome feature, which is in the old lab, whenever there was a fire, you had to take this fire axe and hack your way out of the side of the lab, uh, which is an incredible way for a fire escape. But sadly, you know, that feature was lost because the new lab is made of stainless steel. So you have to be incredibly strong to hack your way out of that. But what we lost in amazing fire escape, we gained in this state of the art class 10,000 clean room, which just means there's an incredibly low and clean environment set inside this otherwise quite dusty salt mine. Um, yeah, so it's, you know, it's a huge uh, working lab, as you can see here in the bottom left, it consists of 4,000 cubic meters of laboratory space, and the large experimental cavern is seven meters tall, so it's a really wonderful place to do dark matter science. Um, so now I'm going to take you, uh, we're going to go on a journey to go underground, and, and this is how scientists get there. I don't know if people can hear the music that comes with this, but uh, it's quite exhilarating. But essentially, yes, in order to get into the mine, you have to wear bright uh, reflective orange uh, outfits with reflectors. You have to wear a helmet, you have to have a lamp, um, and you have to wear shame protection, and you have to wear ear protection, and you have to have a tag. So you put one tag in when you go underground and one second tag when you come out, so people know you've come out in case of a fire. And then seven minutes in the cage, you've descended 1.1 kilometers uh, into the belly of the north coast of England. Uh, so yeah, so we uh, the scientists take the same cages as with all the miners. Uh, and then we gather to make sure everybody's here. And then we make a 500, 650 meter walk to the laboratory. So, so here are some cars actually, because the, because the mining has been going for so long, now the mine face is actually uh, you know, a 40 minute drive uh, once you reach the underground. So when miners get underground, they get in these cars and they drive 40 minutes to work. So it's an absolutely incredible place to, to uh, do research uh, working alongside these wonderful uh, mining community. And then there we go, we've reached the Bobby Underground Lab. But you know, when we first get there, uh, you're in your bright outfit that protects you from the mine uh, with your respirator in the case of uh, a carbon monoxide, uh, fire, uh, but you know, you can't just go into our clean space that way because you're going to carry all the dust and mine with you. So what we have to do is get changed into our clean room outfit. So that's these white Tyvek suits you see here. And we have a new helmet that's suitable for underground and we put these covers on our boots. So now I'm going to take you into our underground laboratory space. So this should work. Oh, cool. Okay. By magic of uh, virtual reality, we have entered. Uh, so we've come through this door. We've got changed there. That's the changing room. And the first thing you see when we get into Bowie is the, the kitchen area, which is actually in many ways the most important area, of course, because we all need food and tea and coffee that fuels all the science underground. <clears throat> because it's a, a science facility in a salt mine, we have to carry all of our water underground with us. So they come in these barrows. Uh, and then the scientists have their daily planning and they do their health and safety checks uh, to make sure it's safe to work underground. And this is where we cook our lunch. Uh, and here we have the UK's deepest uh, toilet. So at uh, 1.1 kilometers, uh, this is actually the most important feature and our favorite feature of the new lab, um, because in the old labs, none of the old versions of the lab did we have an actual working toilet. So in those cases, if you needed to use the bathroom, you just have to go out into the mine tunnels and find a dark bit and turn out your head, turn your head torch off. That's very important. Uh, and make sure no miners drive by you whilst you're uh, doing whatever you need to do. Uh, right, so now we leave the kitchen and the first thing we see is the bugs area. So this is a material screening area. So this is a state-of-the-art facility, world-leading material screening. What they do is they're selecting the building material used to build next generation of dark matter detectors because you want your detector to be made as uh, of low radiation material as possible. So again, uh, so it doesn't swamp out your dark matter signal if and when we see one. So next to that, we have, uh, you have, uh, you know, liquid, uh, you have nitrogen generation facility. This is generates nitrogen gas to, uh, to supply all of the experiments running underground. Uh, we also have liquid argon and can we see some liquid argon, liquid nitrogen underground to cool our germanium detectors. And also we have other detectors that require liquid argon, uh, argon gas to fill. 
And as we move through the labs, you can see all the experiments run along the left here. And we, have, we keep our walkway very clear on the right side of the lab. And the lab is air conditioned to a cool uh, 20 degrees because without air conditioning actually, because we're so much deeper into the ground and closer to the core of the earth, the tunnels uh, is actually close to 40 degrees Celsius. So we don't want any of that. Um, so here we have our, uh, the current generation of uh, dark matter detector at Bowlby. So this experiment is called Sickness. Uh, so it's protected inside all this water castle. So whenever we have detectors, uh, they, we still have to protect them from the, there's still radiation from the lab and the environment. So the dark matter detectors now are in further shields. So we call them, we call the shielding that block out radiation castles. So this is a water castle here. And you can see it with any good uh, modern physics experiment, you have lots of cabling that goes with that and gases that feed it. Um, so this is the sickness experiment, uh, which is a directional dark matter detector. And you can spot, if you look really carefully here, a signature from the 2015 Nobel laureate Kajita when he visited the lab and he signed our detector. So here, as we proceed along the lab, uh, we see lots of lead. So lead and copper are the most popular materials used to build our castles to protect our uh, detectors because they are very heavy, as you know, dense. So they're good at absorbing uh, radiation. So that's why we like it. And we can make copper very clean. So usually we put lead on the outside and then very clean copper on the inside. So this is a old castle that's now being used by the atomic weapons establishment. Uh, so they have two detectors in here and they're using those to measure air filters that they used to take samples in various environmental locations. Uh, so yeah, so they're making environmental measurements with that. <clears throat> Here is the old castle from the Zeppelin III experiment, which is a big dark matter detector. And uh, so when this thing, this is only half the size, when it's full, it's 70 tons and it's twice the size, but this is being used. So Bowlby, since it's expanded, has all this extra space and now doing multidisciplinary science. So this has been used to do lots of different experiments like studying life in extremely low radiation environments or uh, currently measuring the half-life of carbon-14. Uh, and finally, since I'm running out of time, I'm just going to quickly show you the final end bit of the lab. So this is the large experimental cavern, seven meters tall, and we're doing R&D for a future generation experiment called Watch, uh, AIT Neo Watchman. So that's a anti-nuclear, uh, nuclear, it's a nuclear non-proliferation experiment. The idea is to build a detector so you can check on rogue states to make sure they don't have, uh, so you can work out where the nuclear reactors are and they are not stealing any of the enriched cores to be building dirty bonds. Uh, and finally, not enriching uh, plutonium, plutonium, plutonium 239. Sorry, that was a hard word to say. And finally, the last thing I just want to point out, this is the Zeppelin II detector, very small and kind of inconspicuous in this huge lab, but this is really one of the pioneered, this is the first dark matter detector to use a uh, technology called dual phase TPC, which is now used widely across the world in most underground dark matter detectors. So it was actually pioneered here in the UK. So very successful uh, detector. Uh, right, so and that comes to the end of our experimental cavern. So we still have some space there. Uh, and here I'll just spin around to have a look at the lab. And that's the end of my tour of Bobby. Thank you very much for listening. I'm going to stop sharing there. Does anybody have any questions? So we have a question from Barry Sharp saying, <laughs> of course, it always comes back to toilet talk, right? When you flush <laughs> the toilet, where does it go? Mm, very good question. Uh, the water is then taken out of the lab and dumped in a huge storage tank outside. And once that's full, uh, they cap it and they, t they, they get it out of the mine. You heard it here first, folks. Remember that. <laughs> uh, there's also some other lab experiment, underground labs, which uh, have incendiary toilets, which are essentially huge fire pits. So when you uh, press that flush button, this hole opens and it looks like the hate house of... Uh, the flames of hell burning the Nova, which is also very exciting. Very <laughs> that is very exciting. Um, I just love that. I mean, um, normally if you do outreach when you're with astronomy, the first question you always get asked is, how do astronauts pee in space? <laughs> yeah. So now balance this out. Like, now we know how to pee in UK's deepest toilets. <laughs> That's right. Well, it's out of order as well, so I think we've covered all bases there. And <laughs> <laughs> um, we've also got a question from Megan asking, how many fires were there? Oh, uh, sadly zero. I never got to use the axe. I only ever get to wield it in anticipation, but never got to use it in anger. I like I said that sadly. <laughs> oh, oh, okay. Yeah, okay. Right. <laughs> Very fortunately. Very fortunate. And, and the mine, of course, is, a, you know, they provide us with all the support infrastructure of the health and safety aspects. So, yeah, they've been, they've been great. And the, the mine is actually, I was surprised to learn. Well, maybe not, but it's actually one of the, one of the safest places to work, I think. 
uh, on, you know, it's actually statistically safer than an average office, I think, or something like this, I was told. I can believe that. I can get some pretty nasty paper cuts in your office. So, you know, it's, I believe it. <laughs> yeah, um, so another question we have from Megan again is, if we are able to detect dark matter, what's the next step? Ooh, good question. Um, so the next step would be making a precise measurement of what the dark matter is, because a lot of these detectors are very good at uh, searching. But once we find it, uh, we want to study exactly what its properties are. And for that, we might need a different type of detector. So we'll be take, needing new generations of smart ideas to come up with. If we find dark matter, there'd be a, you know, uh, an interest in the field to study exactly what it is and how it works. Brilliant. I love how we did a virtual tour for our first virtual event on so some sort of like <laughs> virtual reality that we're now finding ourselves in. And yeah. some highly coveted PPE you were wearing in that video as well, I see. <laughs> yes. Uh, every time I went to Bowlby for a while, they had a new piece of PPE for me to add. So it was interesting. At some point, I was so weighed down by PPE. I was like, no wonder this place is so safe. <laughs> Brilliant. Well, thank you so much for that wonderful talk. Um, and for those who don't know, Jim Ran is part of our core AOT Edinburgh team as well. So when we do finally end up back in the pub, uh, please do come and say hi and buy the guy a pint for being so awesome. Thank you. All right, so next up, we're gonna give those brain cells a little break after that excellent talk. And we are going to have our game with our illustrious games master, John, if we're gonna pass over to him to play Who Wants to Be a Millionaire Astro Style. Thanks, Amy. So uh, hello, everybody. Uh, watching on YouTube and thank you for tuning in to AOT Off Tap. This is a new thing for all of us, so it's a new way of doing things and it's a new way of playing a game as well, so we'll see how it goes. Um, we asked for uh, some participants for our Who Wants to Be a Millionaire astronomy game on YouTube and we asked on Twitter and we didn't get any responses, so we've got one of our, our own, our own team, uh, Fred, so one of our AOT team, Fred. Fred, can you mute? Hello. Say hello to the folks. Hello. So this is the lovely Fred, and he will be our contestant today on Who Wants to Be a Millionaire Astronomy. So I'm just going to share my screen now and set up the presentation. So hold on. Okay. Second. Okay. So, Fred. You obviously have 15 questions, and there are 15 yeah. questions to answer on this quiz. Each one will obviously get you closer up towards a million. You do have three lifelines, which I'll explain, and you can ask those as we go through, and I'll show you those as we go along. So we'll start out with each of those questions. Are you ready, Fred? I am. Okay, all right, so, hold on. Just a few technical difficulties here. And now we're not responding. Hold on one second. Okay. Uh. Okay. All right. So let's play Who Wants to Be a Millionaire Astronomy. So obviously, Fred, you have three lifelines. You can phone a friend, which will be one of our members in our team. So you can phone any people in our team. So you can phone any of the guys who are on the AOT team. You can ask the audience or you can get a 50-50. Is that okay, clear? Und understood. Okay, all right, so let's start. First question, Fred, complete the lyric. Fly me to the wank and let me play among the stars. Uh, B, moon. I do have to ask you, just for dramatic tension, is that your final answer? Yes, sir. You are correct. Well done. That was moon. You've won 100 virtual pounds, which due to inflation is technically zero. But you've done very okay. well. You go home with 100 pounds. Well done. Second question. Fred, are you ready for your second question? I am. Sorry. Which planet, I'll do my best Chris Tarrant, hold on. Which planet is known as the red planet? Is it A, Mars, B, Jupiter, C, Neptune, or D, Planet Hollywood? I will go with A, Mars. Again, for tension, is that your final answer? 
Yes, sir. Of course, you are correct. You have won two hundred pounds. Congratulations. Hello. Question three: How did the solar system form? Was it the big? And by the way, this is according to various theories. Nobody's going to argue with different theories of how the universe came to be. But for the purposes of the quiz, how did it form? The big pop, the big boom, the big bang, or the big crash? Uh, that'll be C, the big bang. And I guess that is your final answer? Yes, Chris. Well then, you won 300 pounds. Nope. Question four. Who was the first man to walk on the moon? Was it Neil Diamond? Was it Jerry Armstrong? Was it Buzz Lightyear? Or was it Neil Armstrong? Uh, it'll be D, Neil Armstrong. Final answer? Yes, sir. Not Buzz Lightyear? Uh, I was tempted. Not Jerry Armstrong? Don't think so. I don't know who that is. So you're correct. Yes, it is <laughs> Neil Armstrong. Jerry Armstrong is a name that I made up for this quiz. <laughs> Next question. How many planets are in the solar system? Is it A, 8, B, 10, C, 5, or D, 6? Uh... I thought that I thought Pluto got reclassified as a planet, but it'll have to be a eight. Is this your final answer for a thousand pounds? Uh, yeah, I think so. You're correct. Well done. You have won a thousand pounds. Nice. Very exciting. Now, I'll ask you at this point: Would you like to stop? and go home with a thousand pounds, which I'm not going to give you because technically we don't have the money for it because we run on a very <laughs> low budget. Or would you like to continue, which is probably the best option, to try and win 2,000 pounds or higher? Let's continue. Are you sure? Yeah, absolutely. All right, let's move on. How many stars are there on Orion's belt? Is it two? Is it three? Six? Or is it four? Uh, that'll be B, so three stars. Three stars. Final answer? Yep. You are correct. Well done. That is £2,000. Next question for £4,000. What does NASA stand for? Is it the National Aeronautics and Space Administration? The National Astronomy Space Astronauts? Is it National American Super Astronauts? Or is it the National Aeronautical Starlight Association? That'll be A. These are tough, these, aren't they? Okay. Fred is saying A. Is he correct? <laughs> is this your final answer, Fred? Yes. Not National Astronomy Space Astronauts. I really like that one, actually. <laughs> All right, we'll go yeah, with this one. A, is it National Aeronautics and Space Administration? Correct, well done. You now are on 4,000 pounds. You're doing very well. You have all your three lifelines intact. Everybody's riveted at home. Thousands of people watching on YouTube, no pressure. <laughs> so for 8,000 pounds, I've stopped giving you the option to stop because technically we can't and it ruins the tension. So let's move on. That's fine, yep. How many miles an hour does a satellite do around the Earth? Now, this is the sort of average speed of a satellite in space. Suddenly they got harder, right? That was quite a jump. Yeah. <laughs> now, is it A, 26,000 miles per hour? B, 17,000 miles per hour? C, 10,000 miles per hour? Or D, 26 miles per hour? Um, now you have three I lifelines. I'm remember. not sure. Let's do, ask the audience. Oh, and, Please ignore a slight error, because A and D appear to be the same. Yeah, I noticed. <laughs> okay, ask the audience, please. Ask the audience. Okay, so, Fred would like to ask the audience, so let's ask the audience. Oh. Okay, so we're asking the audience, how many miles an hour does a satellite do around the Earth? So the audience came back with their answers. They said A was 29%, B was 67%, C was 0%, and oddly, the same answer <laughs> as D was 
Four percent. So we've either got a very informed audience or an audience who's not quite sure what's going on, and they're they're too much off tap to understand what's going on. So, what's your answer, Fred? Okay, let's go with the audience. Let's go with B. B. Seventeen thousand miles per hour. Your final answer. Yep. Let's see if you are correct. You are correct. Well done. You have won eight thousand pounds. Well done, audience. I got scared there because I thought the technology was going to break because clearly the person who's making it broke. So let's move on to the next question. This is going very serious now. Money is going up. This is this is a you know at least a holiday to sort of you know I don't know Cyprus for about a week now. So for sixteen thousand pounds, how many years ago was the solar system formed? Was it A, 1.8 billion, B, 7.8 billion, C, 3.9 billion, or D, 4.6 billion? Uh, I'll go with D, 4.6 billion years. Are you sure about this? Uh, fairly. Would you like to uh, think again? Would you like to use any of your lifelines? You're sure about this? Is this your final answer? Yeah, go for it. All right, D, 4.6 billion. Are you correct? Oh, oh no! Oh, oh no! The correct answer was in fact three point nine billion. Three point nine billion years really? old. It, am I, I'm pretty sure I'm right on that. Oh. Um, unfortunately, Fred, we've cut you off. You did win in the end. You did very, very well. You, you did very, very well indeed. You got up to eight thousand pounds. Didn't quite make it to sixteen thousand, but you did impressively well. Well done, Fred. So if everybody could give Fred a round of applause on YouTube. Well oh. done, Fred. <laughs> Thank you. All right, so hope you play along at home and you manage to get all your answers correct. I have to admit, I have no idea about speed to satellites, so I think Fred did brilliantly there, so well done to you. And um, we got some correct answers on our YouTube chat as well, so people are more clued up than, you know, they perhaps give themselves credit for. Um, but hopefully they will take part in some of the games that we organise next month and not be so shy in the future, but we can always rely on our team to step up to the plate when needs be. Um, so just give everybody's brains a little rest and allow you to top up your beers, go feed the cat, whatever else you need to do. We'll just have a short five minute break before we come back for our final two speakers, Manisha and Moya. So we will shall see you soon. That was pretty cool.
Hi everybody and welcome back to the second part of our AOT stream. Um, sorry for our little technical difficulties there, There's some slight confusion as you can expect. Um, this is why you don't work with live TV children and animals folks um, and probably not us either but there we go. Uh, we're doing the best we can. So we would like to introduce our next speaker for you now who is Manisha Caleb. Um, Manisha completed her PhD specialising in fast radio bursts from the Australian National University in Canberra and she's currently a postdoctoral research at the University of Manchester which is where I did my PhD funnily enough. Um, she's working on searching for and understanding fast radio bursts with next generation radio telescopes like the Meerkat telescope in South Africa. So she's going to be presenting to us today a brief history of fast radio bursts. So we'd like to hand over to Manisha. Thanks, Amy. Um, right, let me try to share my screen. Um, right. So fast radio bursts or um, FRBs are possibly one of the most fascinating phenomena of astrophysics in the last decade. Um, FRBs have been getting a lot of attention from the media over the last few years. So I thought I'd present a very brief history of fast radio bursts and hopefully share uh, some of the excitement that I've experienced researching the field. So we're gonna start off way back in 2000 uh, when it all began and then slowly make our way down to 2020 touching on just a few key milestones, and then we're gonna see where we currently stand. So it all started in 2007, uh, when astronomers announced the discovery of an extremely bright, never seen before, possibly extragalactic burst of radio emission. Now this uh, burst was found in archival data, so it was data taken in 2001 using the Parkes Radio Telescope in Australia. Because it wasn't like anything anyone had ever seen before, uh, they decided to nickname it the Lorimer Burst after Duncan Lorimer who discovered it. So this is what the Lorimer Burst looked like. We've got uh, time on the x-axis, frequency on the y-axis. So as the radio wave propagates or travels from the source to the observer or the telescope on Earth, the higher frequencies arrive first, and then the lower frequencies are arrived later, resulting in this beautiful sweep that you see there. Uh, the color scale basically represents intensity. So uh, the darker the color, the higher the intensity or the brighter the signal. So as the radio wave travels to us, it kind of accounts for all the electrons along the path. So the total number of electrons uh, is quantified by something called the dispersion measure. So the larger the number of electrons, the more, uh, the larger the distance the signal seems to have traveled and the further away your source appears to be. So naively, naively if you look at it, uh, dispersion measure can be thought of as a proxy for distance. So the larger the value of dispersion measure, the further away your source appears to be. The dispersion measure for this Lorimer burst was way more than anything that our galaxy could account for suggesting that it originated at extragalactic distances. Now, everybody got very excited and then astronomers went back and they looked at other archival data. So they looked at data in um, the X-rays, the optical, the gamma rays, and they tried to find any event that might have occurred around the same time that this Lorimer burst was seen in the radio data. Unfortunately, they didn't find anything. So it appeared that the Lorimer burst represented an entirely new class of radio source. So motivated by this, astronomers went back and they decided to search existing archival data at that point in time to see whether there were other such similar bursts in the data. And in doing so, they discovered these peritons. Now the frenzy from 2007 died down in 2011 with the discovery of the peritons because even though they looked uh, remarkably similar to the Lorimer burst, they had a few striking differences in common with radio frequency interference. Now, radio frequency interference, or as we call it, RFI, is just man-made signals. So here we've got a comparison of the peritons on the left and the Lorimer burst on the right. If you just look at the top two plots, you can see that the Lorimer burst is kind of uniform in intensity across your observing bandwidth or the range of frequencies, whereas the peritons are sort of, you know, blotchy or patchy. When a radio telescope looks at the sky, we see pixels or beams. And the Parkes Radio Telescope has 13 such pixels or beams spatially separated on the sky. 
An astrophysical signal um, is only typically expected to see in one of these pixels or beams, and depending on its brightness, maybe a couple of more beams. The Lorimer burst was an extremely bright event, so it was seen in three beams. If you take the paratons, they were detected in all 13 beams of the Parkes multi-beam receiver. So this suggested that the origin of these paratons was much, much closer. The community at this point was very divided. So you had the believers, we had the non-believers. So some people believed that the Lorimer burst was indeed the real deal, and it was truly astrophysical, but then we also had the other group of people who believed that the Lorimer burst and the paratons were one and the same, and it was just man-made indifference. So for years, the Lorimer burst was in a class of its own. And it wasn't until 2013 when four more similar bursts were discovered was the, re was the excitement in the fast transient community actually uh, reignited and the class fast radio bursts emerged. Fast because they only lasted a few milliseconds, uh, radio because this was the wavelength in which they were being discovered and burst, well, because they appeared and disappeared in a flash. It then became clear that whatever these FRBs were, they really were happening and quite often too. Now an FRB pulse typically lasts uh, about a thousandth of a second, so a few milliseconds. And in this time, it emits as much energy as the sun would in an entire day. So you can imagine these millisecond duration flashes occurring all over the sky. They're extremely energetic and they're coming from billions of light years away. But funnily enough, um, we don't know when they happen. Uh, we don't know where in the sky they happen, nor do we know what causes them. But what we do know is about 5,000 of these blips or flashes go off in the sky every day randomly and so quickly that they'd be very easy to miss in the blink of an eye. Now, it was very unsettling uh, at this point that almost all the FRBs were being discovered exclusively at the Parkes Radio Telescope. So it was a huge relief to the community when the Arecibo Telescope in Puerto Rico announced the discovery of their FRB in 2014. So this got everybody excited uh, because we now knew, okay, FRBs were really happening because they were being detected at two different telescopes in two different parts of the world. And then the entire world was now in a race to figure out what these elusive bursts really were. Though even though we knew that these FRBs were happening, we still had the whole mystery of the paratons looming over our heads. And this was put to rest in 2015 uh, when they were found to be due to microwave ovens at the Parkes Radio Telescope. So a colleague of mine, Emily Petrov, um, she identified them to be coming from microwave ovens on site at the Parkes Radio Telescope. So basically what happens is when uh, the hungry impatient astronomer opens the microwave oven door before the timer runs out, the microwave shuts down immediately emitting a small blip of harmless radiation. And if the telescope is oriented in the right direction, uh, the signal gets picked up as a paraton. And I must say that I myself have done that several times, but that was before I knew what paratons were. If you look at the top uh, left figure, you have a histogram of the paratons and the FRBs as a function of time of day. Uh, the FRBs are represented by the purple histograms and the paratons are represented by the pink histograms. And you can see that the paratons peak at lunchtime, whereas the FRBs don't really care about the time of the day. So at this point, it became very clear uh, that the FRBs and paratons were two completely different and distinct classes of objects. And then something completely unexpected happened. The FRB that was discovered in 2014 with Arecibo was found to repeat in 2016. Um, now this kind of threw a spanner in the works because until now, none of the previous FRBs had been seen to repeat despite astronomers going back and looking at the same patch of sky for repeat pulses. So it was quite odd because um, until now, everybody assumed that FRBs were one-off in nature. And, the, and most theories for what FRBs could be involved cataclysmic events. So this meant uh, that the source or the progenitor producing these FRBs was destroyed or obliterated in the process. But the repeating FRB suggested that whatever the source was that was producing these energetic event, events survived. Now, as of 2016, 
um, we had more FRB theories than what than actual FRBs. And this was um, most of the theories ranged from flare stars uh, to some sort of exotic interactions with black holes to more um, standard uh, stars called neutron stars, in particular, uh, a type of neutron star called magnetars. Now, magnetars are these, um, they have immensely high magnetic fields, so about 1,000 times more powerful than the standard neutron star. And this is what most leading theories are still based on. Now, because this particular FRB repeated, uh, astronomers were able to point um, more sensitive telescopes with better spatial resolution and also other telescopes at different wavelengths uh, to pinpoint the exact galaxy that this FRB was originating in. Um, so this actually was a huge milestone in the field because until now we only sort of knew FRBs to be originating at different parts of the sky, but we now knew an exact galaxy this was uh, coming from. But unfortunately, we still don't quite know the exact nature of the source producing these FRBs. Now, in order to really localize or pinpoint the galaxy upon discovery, we needed interferometric detections. So the repeating FRB was able to be localized because it repeated. So astronomers could point uh, more telescopes at it whenever it repeated. However, most FRBs were being observed to be one-off events, which meant that in order to pinpoint the galaxy, we needed to do it at the first shot. Interferometers are a special type of radio telescope, uh, which have extremely good spatial resolution. And this was exactly what the ASCAP telescope in Australia aimed to do. Um, actually, ASCAP has quite a few localizations, so they've uh, narrowed down uh, FRBs to the exact galaxies that they're coming from. But unfortunately, there doesn't really appear to be any kind of a trend in the galaxies that these FRBs are originating from. Uh, more recently, maybe like a couple of years ago, the Chime Telescope in Canada um, has started scanning the skies to look for FRBs. And because Ch uh, Chime can see a large part of the sky at any given uh, time, they've discovered several hundreds of FRBs. Um, so we know of about maybe 500 FRBs, of which only uh, 100 have been published. And uh, Chime has also detected several tens of repeaters. So if you look at this graph of the number of FRB detections as a function of year, you can see that the field has sort of gained uh, a lot of momentum in the last few years or so, and the number of FRBs has increased almost exponentially. And even more recently, uh, uh, like a couple of weeks or so ago, the Chime Telescope announced the discovery of an FRB-like pulse from a known magnetar in our own galaxy. And another radio telescope called STAIR-2 detected the same radio pulse independently. Now the radio pulse also happened to be coincident with X-ray flares and gamma ray flares uh, detected by space-based telescopes. Now this is a huge step towards understanding what FRBs could be and a possible link between magnetars and FRBs. Because until now, Despite all these years, we have never detected any kind of emission uh, other than the radio for an FRB-like pulse. So this is the first time astronomers have detected multi-wavelength emission for an FRB-like pulse. It's still early days to arrive at any sort of conclusion, uh, but currently observations are underway at almost every radio telescope under the world to observe this particular magnetar and um, understand the properties uh, of the radio bursts as well as the um, high energy emission. So to sum it up, uh, I think we as a community have come a long way since uh, 2007 and we've made a lot of progress, uh, but despite all this, I think um, there are still a lot of unanswered questions. The most fundamental question being, what are FRBs? I mean, what causes FRBs? Um, we think uh, the recent discovery of the magnetar uh, in our galaxy and its FRB-like pulses that it emits might provide us with some sort of a clue or some sort of a link between magnetars and FRBs. But uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that all uh, FRBs come from magnetars. We still, uh, we still have a long way to go, and uh, I definitely think there are a lot of exciting times ahead. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Manisha. That was a really excellent talk, really interesting. Um, 
I like the story about the microwaves because it reminded me of, is it Robert Wilson and Arno Penzias when they were looking for the Big Bang signal and they nearly missed it because they had this low hissing sort of static noise in the background and they yeah. went to check the telescope and discovered there was pigeons roosting in there. So they thought it was just due to pigeon poop, basically. Um, That's how they, they wrote it off and, you know, they nearly missed, what you know, a, a, the glow with the Big Bang and, you know, maybe your microwave's actually covering up some major vital point about the history and origin of the universe that we're just missing because you microwave and you spaghetti bolognese who knows um so we have a couple of questions on our youtube chat so firstly we have one from clark saying are there any known uses of frbs any known uses of frbs that's an excellent question um so the thing the nice thing about frbs is um, the radio signal kind of carries the imprint of the medium that it travels through. So the dispersion measure on the signal encode all the information about uh, the path that it travels through as well as the uh, environment local to the uh, FRB uh, source itself as well as the host galaxy. So we could potentially understand um, extragalactic like the intergalactic medium and the other galaxies much better with these frb like pulses brilliant and um, we have another question from alex saying um why was that drop de in detected frbs in 2019 why was there a drop in detections in 2019 oh i think that's because uh, a lot of them have probably been detected or discovered in 2019 but they still haven't been published Oh, yeah, the classic. So we don't, so all FRBs are not necessarily published as soon as they're discovered. So there might be a year or six months lag because sometimes people just want to get a lot of information, a lot of FRBs, try to um, identify trends in the data before they publish a paper. Yeah, of course, we all want our science peer reviewed. Um, so we have another question from Verdia Clement as well saying, do you have a favorite hypothesis for the origin of FRBs? Ooh. I want to say magnetars, but now I think that's going to sound very cliche because everyone says magnetars and we've found a magnetar. But um, so there was this theory about uh, a black hole. So I think it was called a blitzar, where a supermassive neutron star uh, collapses into a black hole. But we, we're fairly certain that's not the model. But I just thought that was a cool model. But I'd, I'd be very happy if it was uh, a magnetar because I work with neutron stars and most leading theories are based around neutron stars. So, But even if it is a neutron star, it's not going to be anything. I don't think it's anything like we've seen before because even the magnetar in our own galaxy, it was a radio quiet magnetar. So it was only seen to uh, emit in the X-rays and gamma rays so far. And then all of a sudden, it turned on in the radio and we don't quite understand what is happening uh, at the moment. So I think magnetars are probably my most favorite theory. There you go. <laughs> All right, still got questions flying in for you. Um, so Rajesh Gaga, um, since you can pinpoint galaxies where offer FRBs originate, do you see them occurring more in younger galaxies or more mature galaxies? That is an excellent question. Um, so, so far, I think one interesting thing about these galaxies is that the locations of FRBs in the galaxies appear to be in star forming regions. However, I think it's still a small number of statistics. We don't have a large enough sample for us to say anything conclusively just yet, but the galaxies are sort of all over the spectrum. And Rajesh has another question. Um, what is the furthest galaxy from where you've spotted an FRB? Ah, good question. I think it is at a redshift of about point five, I want to say. Um, I don't know the math for the light years, but it is potentially billions of light years away, that's for sure. So it is really far away. Space is big. Exactly. <laughs> um, and then I have a final question from Fred, actually. Um, how many sources of FRBs do we know of? Um, okay, so I'm, I'm not sure what I'm not sure I follow sources because we don't really know what causes FRBs. And, uh, but most of the FRBs we've seen, um, they're all millisecond in duration and they all exhibit this beautiful sweep. But some of their properties are quite different. So each FRB pulse is kind of unique in its own way. Uh, so it's hard to say what 
sources of producing these FRBs, but whatever it is, it is extremely energetic and it's unlike anything we've seen in our own galaxy. Brilliant. Um, well, I think that's the final question we have for you. So thank you so much again, Manisha. That was really, really interesting. Um, I hope we can have you back at a future event to give us another talk. We'd love to have you. Um, so just while we swap over, our next speaker coming up is Moya. Uh, Moya McTeer, she's an astrophysicist and folklorist based in New York City at Columbia University. Um, I've never met any sort of folklorist, let alone once an astrophysicist as well, so I'm really looking forward to this. Um, outside of research, she hosts a podcast and a YouTube show called ExoLaw, so do check that out. We'll give the details out at the bottom of this video and on social media afterwards. Um, and on this podcast, she invites expert guests to help her imagine the life and culture on other planets. Um, so I'll definitely be checking that one out myself. So we would like to introduce you to Moya. Hi, thank you so much. Uh, I will start to share my screen. Um, yeah, that's it. I think so. Okay. Technology is hard. Um, so I am about to enter into the final semester of my PhD program, uh, which means I have to start practicing for my dissertation defense. And I'm going <laughs> to do that here by, by telling you about my research. Um, and hopefully you've seen this movie. I actually just saw Close Encounters of the Third Kind for the first time a couple of years ago, uh, but I thought that it was a pretty great uh, title for my, for my thesis, and you will soon see why. Uh, so when I was in college or when I was at university, I started learning about astronomy and I was introduced to the idea of Goldilocks zones or habitable zones around stars. So these are places around stars where the temperature is just right for a planet to potentially host liquid water. If the planet were any closer to its star, all of the water would boil off. If it were any further away from its star, then all of the water would freeze. Um, and then uh, you can see why it's called the Goldilocks zone because of the, the too hot, too cold, just right uh, porridge that Goldilocks ate. So I started learning about these and it made me wonder, is there a Goldilocks zone or a habitable zone in the galaxy? Uh, before I get into that, I should tell you that there are different parts of the galaxy. So there's this part of the galaxy called the disk. Uh, that's where the sun is. And you can imagine that the disk is kind of like a pancake. Uh, it's, it's a mostly flat area. And the sun and other stars like it are like blueberries or chocolate chips in the pancake. Um, and then there are other parts of the galaxy as well. There's this big uh, kind of spherical bit of chaos in the middle of the galaxy that astronomers call the Milky Way bulge. Um, and I can say this because it's astronomy on tap, but every single time my professors said Milky Way bulge in one of my astronomy classes, I giggled and I felt like a 12 year old boy, uh, but that's how immature I am. So I'm just gonna share that with you. Uh, and then outside of the, the disc, there's this giant uh, Milky Way halo where we see a lot of dark matter. Um, but this is where I focus on my research because this is where all of the stars are. Uh, and so you can see that the sun is here in the disk of the galaxy, but why are we there? What's special about this part of the galaxy? Uh, is there something here that makes it much more likely that habitable planets are likely to form? And this whole uh, field of research is what some people call the, the search for the galactic habitable zone. And that's been uh, going on for a while. I think people started looking for a galactic habitable zone in the 1970s. And since then, uh, people have looked at a lot of different ways to define the galactic habitable zone. So people have tried to look at uh, supernova rates. So figuring out how often supernovae will go off in different parts of the galaxy and use that to figure out how high uh, or how high the levels of radiation would be in different parts of the galaxy because radiation we think would be bad for habitability on planets throughout the Milky Way. Uh, people have also looked at the levels of heavy metals that you see in different parts of the galaxy. Astronomers consider anything heavier than helium a metal, which is super annoying, but you know, that's what we have to go with. Um, and if you look at the, we call the level uh, of, of heavy metals metallicity, and you can track 
a trend uh, for metallicity in different parts of the galaxy. So um, the halo, the galactic halo, has a lower metallicity than the galactic disk. And we think that we should have high levels of metals or high metallicity if we're going to find habitable planets. Uh, they've also looked at the ages or the spectral types of stars because not all stars are created equal and the truly massive stars will only live for a very short period of time. Uh, life did form very quickly on Earth within about a billion years. There were a single cell organisms here on Earth, but intelligent life didn't form until four and a half billion years after the solar system formed. So if you're going to look for intelligent life, you have to be sure you're looking for stars that have lived long enough to form that type of intelligent life. Uh, I don't focus on, oh, and the, the sun has been around for about four and a half billion years and will live for about 10 billion years. Um, I don't focus on any of those. I focus on the motion of the galaxy, what we call galactic dynamics. So I look at how the, the movement, the motion of stars affects the types of planets that can form around them. Uh, so just a basic fact, some stars have planets and all stars are moving. Uh, this again is where the sun is. Uh, it's moving around the galaxy in a, in a clockwise way if you're looking from the top of the galaxy down. Uh, and the sun is actually moving at about 250 kilometers per second around the center of the galaxy. And for the most part, it moves on a very nice and predictable circular orbit. In fact, most of the stars in the disk, uh, remember that's the, the pancake bit of the galaxy, most of the stars in the, in the disk are moving on very predictable, I'm not gonna say boring, but uh, <laughs> I don't think they're as interesting as other orbits, uh, they're very circular. Uh, with with some, some perturbation from a circular orbit, but not much of one. Uh, and if you go away from the disk and you start looking in the center, in the Milky Way bulge, you see that the orbits of stars are much more interesting. Uh, they're moving a lot faster. The stars are much closer together. The Milky Way bulge only accounts for maybe like 10 to 15 percent of the, the area or the volume of the Milky Way but it has more than 30% of the Milky Way's mass. Uh, there are about 30 billion stars in the Milky Way bulge, and they don't move on circular orbits. They're moving on what we call rosettes. Uh, so if you've ever seen like a spirograph, uh, they're moving on these very hard to predict and um, hard to characterize uh, spiral orbits. And that makes me think, that those stars in the Milky Way bulge should have more close encounters. By close encounter, I don't mean that the stars actually collide. That's incredibly rare. Uh, but I mean that they'll have close flybys. And even these close flybys can have drastic consequences for the planets that are orbiting some of these stars. So to answer this question, does, uh, do the stars in the Milky Way bulge have more close encounters than stars in the disk? I simulated the orbits of a million stars. Uh, this is because I can do this because we know how the stars are distributed throughout the Milky Way bulge. We know how the mass, and that's both stars and gas and dust, we know how all of the mass in the Milky Way bulge is distributed. And so using a, a powerful computer, I can actually simulate how these stars are moving over time. Uh, and I, so I did a million stars and I, I set the simulator running for um, a, about a billion years, it must have been more than that, about 10 billion years, which took a long time. Uh, here you can see some samples of the orbits of stars in the Milky Way bulge, um, and you can see that they're not circular. Uh, so they have the, these weird shapes, they, they intersect with each other many times. Um, and once I had done this simulation, I could actually go back into the, the output of the simulation and count how many encounters uh, each star had with another star. And it turns out that, yeah, they do have more encounters than stars out here in the disk of the Milky Way. So I'm going to spend a, a while on this plot. Uh, I just published these results in a paper, and this was, I think, like the big plot in the paper. So I'm going to focus on it for a little while. So the axis at the bottom, the x-axis, is telling you how many encounters per billion years you can expect a star to have. And the y-axis, or the vertical axis, is telling you what fraction of stars 
have encounters with uh, have that many encounters. Uh, so let's just follow the the yellow line. Hopefully you can see my cursor. We're going to follow this yellow line. And this yellow line is saying that basically no stars have um, 10 to the 5. That's 100,000 encounters. No stars have that many encounters. But about 80% of stars have one encounter. And 50% of stars have multiple encounters, several dozen encounters. Um, the reason I have multiple lines here is because um, you can define an encounter by the distance of the encounter. So an encounter within 10 AU, uh, one AU or one astronomical unit is the distance from our uh, sun to the earth. Uh, an encounter within 10 AU is going to be a lot more dangerous than an encounter within 1000 AU. Uh, but exactly how dangerous that is depends on a lot of different factors, like exactly how uh, the two stars approach each other and the mass of the two stars involved in the encounter. Uh, so essentially the, the result of my paper was that there are way more stellar encounters happening in the galactic bulge than any of us predicted. Uh, when I first started this project, I thought that maybe 10% of stars would have a close uh, stellar encounter, and I was very wrong because it's more than 80 percent um so that was a that was a great uh result but it doesn't mean anything unless we talk about what the consequences to planets might be so are these close encounters dangerous even if they only happen within a thousand au um if you look at our own solar system the the furthest planet that we know of uh so neptune is at less than 50 AU, less than 50 AU from the sun. But we have the Oort cloud, which is this giant cloud of uh, comets and, and other icy rocks uh, that extends out to maybe 2000 AU. So if our sun, if we picked up our sun and we put it in the Milky Way bulge and it had one of these 1000 AU encounters, the entire Oort cloud would be disrupted. Um, and that could send some of these comets into uh, the inner solar system, those comets could hit the Earth, and we could have another uh, mass extinction event like the dinosaurs did. Uh, so even a thousand AU encounter could be very dangerous. Um, but here I'm showing you this video of two different planetary systems. That tiny yellow dot in the center is a sun or is a star, um, and I'm showing you two planetary systems passing by each other the gravitational pull of both of these stars will uh, affect the, the particles uh, or the planets or the asteroids or comets that are orbiting both of these stars. And this can have a lot of very serious consequences. So these encounters can rip planets away from their host stars. Uh, imagine a, a star flying by, grabbing onto the Earth and then ripping it away from the sun. Uh, bad things would happen if we didn't have the sun. It's our source of light and heat and energy. It's our source of food. Uh, so if we didn't have the sun, if we suddenly got ripped away, that would be disastrous for humankind. Um, these encounters can destabilize planet orbits. So maybe the planets don't get ripped away from their stars immediately, but their orbits get changed just a little bit so that maybe a million years later, the planet gets flung out of its system or it orbits into its star so that the star eats it up. That would be bad too. I probably don't have to tell you that it would be bad if the earth got eaten by the sun. We would not survive that. Uh, and then finally, if these encounters happen early enough in the whole planet formation process, it could interrupt or maybe even stop the planet formation process altogether. So the big consequence of this research, if we, if we make the simplifying assumptions about what these encounters mean for planetary systems, is that we probably shouldn't expect to find life in the bulge. If we're looking for a galactic habitable zone, it's probably not in the center of the galaxy. This isn't anything new. Uh, I told you that galactic habitable zone research has been done since the 70s, and they were looking for a bunch of different factors. When you look at those other factors like supernova rates or the metallicity of stars, other people have ruled out the galactic bulge way before this. This is just another reason why we shouldn't expect to find many habitable planets in the galactic bulge. But 
if you stop thinking about this in terms of galactic habitability and instead you frame your question because you're interested in looking for rogue planets, those are planets that aren't as, uh, attached gravitationally to any star, it's very possible that we could find a lot of rogue planets in the Milky Way bulge. Uh, we have detected rogue planets before, but a handful. I would be shocked if we had actually found and confirmed more than five rogue planets. Uh, but it's looking like once we get powerful enough telescopes to look into the bulge with any sort of reliability, uh, we might be able to find a lot of rogue planets there. So this research has, you know, a lot of different, what's the word? Uh, there are a lot of different um, outcomes for this research, uh, and I am very excited to write it up in my dissertation and defend it and then get the PhD. Uh, but that's all I have, and I will, I will take your questions. Thanks, Moya. That was a fascinating talk. Um, I feel like the galactic bulge is quite often overlooked by a lot of people. Like, there's a lot of really interesting stuff to be learned from the center of our own galaxy, like let alone looking out, you know, thousands of light years away to others. Um, you know, obviously you can tell a lot archaeologically about, you know, formation of spirals and other similar galaxies in Milky Way by looking at the bulge. So no, it's great to hear about other things, other research that's yeah. been going on. Um, so we do have a question for you um, from Alex. I'll just scroll down to where it was. So he asks, does your research only apply to spiral galaxies or have you explored this search for Goldilocks zones and other types of galaxy? That's a great question, Alex. So I like to use a combination of simulations and observation in my work. And we just don't have these types of high quality observations of individual stellar orbits for uh, stars in other galaxies. So I focus most only on the Milky Way, but this could be uh, generalized to other galaxies. Um, the, the biggest difference that I think of between spiral galaxies and elliptical galaxies, for example, is that spiral galaxies have that very nicely behaved disk where stars are moving on those predictable circular orbits, like I said, but you don't find that in elliptical galaxies. And so I'd expect that uh, elliptical galaxies would be a lot more like the bulge in our own galaxy and that maybe we could expect more stellar encounters to happen in elliptical galaxies if they're dense enough. Great, Bob. Um, so we have another question from Megan. Um, what's the timeline of how long disruption takes when stars pass from the first measurable disruption to the last? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a really great question. It's something that I hope to look at more closely in my next research project, because it depends on just so many factors. Um, it, it depends on how fast the stars are moving as they pass by each other, it depends on the masses of the two stars involved. Um, I get, give you a couple of scenarios. If you have um, a star like our sun and a star that is um, 50 times less or more massive than the sun uh, passing by each other at 1000 AU, then I think it's something like 30% of the particles in our solar system would be either uh, ripped away immediately or ultimately destabilized about a million years later. So I will admit that I have forgotten exactly what your question was, but um, what's the timeline of how things will happen? The timeline, yeah. Um, <laughs> the real question is, it depends on so many different things, um, but you would be able to tell within a million years how bad the ultimate fate of the planetary system should be, even if it takes a billion years for that fate to happen. Uh, well, hopefully that answers your question, Megan. Um, we have another one from Alex. Is there any way to know if such a ripoff has ever happened to the solar system, maybe the dinosaur event? Yeah, um, so we out here in the disk are pretty protected from close stellar encounters, but that doesn't mean they don't happen. Uh, we predict that within the next um, 2 million years or so, um, there should be an encounter that comes within uh, a 10,000 AU of the sun. Um, so we don't know for sure if one of these events would have happened in the past for the solar system, but it's very possible that the, the comet that hit the Earth and killed all the non-avian dinosaurs um, would 
could have been caused by Jupiter or one of the gas giants in our solar system flinging comets towards us. It doesn't necessarily have to be another star flying by. So there we go, perhaps. <laughs> um, so I think that's- I feel as that all of my answers are maybe, <laughs> but that's because there's just so much that we don't know about this field and it depends on so many other things that we'd have to consider that require a supercomputer to give you a real answer. And if it makes you feel better, if we knew everything, you wouldn't have a job. We wouldn't be doing what we're doing, right? If we knew the answers to everything, it's what makes it fun and exciting. <laughs> um, so when's your thesis defense again? Sure. It's in December. December. Uh, I haven't scheduled it exactly yet, but I'll be a doctor by next year. Amazing. So maybe we'll have uh, Dr. Moyer join us for a future talk next year. That'd be excellent. Um, and if it makes you feel better, we've all had a little bit of a giggle at Galactic Bulge. It's not just you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Amy. <laughs> that helps a lot. So if it makes it better or worse, but there we go, I'll just throw that in there. <laughs> All right, so thank you very much, Moya, for that talk. And thank you to our other two speakers as well, Manisha and Shin Ran, for some excellent uh, wide ranging topics. It's been a truly international event for our first virtual event, which has been fantastic. Um, and long may that continue. We've had a couple of comments already asking if you know, there's a possibility we can continue some sort of virtual event even when the world is reopened. Um, you know, it's been a great way to sort of reconnect with people you wouldn't otherwise reach. Um, and I think the way that uh, science outreach is going to happen might well be very different going forward after this event, I think. Um, so, yeah, again, thank you to our speakers. Thank you to all the rest of the AI AOT team, especially to Rachel doing the tech in the background and tearing her hair out at me, messing everything up, <laughs> but never mind. Um, and we hope that you'll join us next month. Please keep an eye on our social media channels on Twitter and on Facebook for information as to the date and speakers for that one. Um, I'll post some relevant links up to our speakers and things after this event that you can find in the comments below this video on YouTube so you can follow them through afterwards. In the meantime, um, keep looking up at the stars and we'll see you in a month. <laughs>